Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I am delighted to have as my guest, Suzanne Jacobs. She is the founder of The Seven, and she is a specialist in helping organizations to get to grips with organizational behavior and performance. She focuses on the neurobiology of trust and motivation. Suzanne, welcome. Hey, Mark, it's really good to be here. Fantastic. Excellent. Would you mind giving the audience a quick 60-second rundown on your background, please? Yeah, absolutely. Potted history. So, uh, ballet dancer, moved from ballet dancing into a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm still to this day not sure how ballet dancing and accountancy matches up. But anyway, there was there was a path. Followed the the, the route of of getting qualified, etc. Realised quite soon on, actually, interesting enough, that it wasn't really a career for me. But having said that, I spent 25 years in finance. In the main, my role of roles have been senior leadership, large corporate finance leading huge changes, restructuring international teams, lots of wonderful, wonderful projects, really gave me everything I, I needed to know in terms of a, a training ground. I have studied two masters and just over 11 years ago, I stepped outside of the corporate world, I went traveling with my what was my very young family at the time, came back, was sponsored for my research into, as you said, the intrinsic motivation, the neurobiology of the intrinsic motivation and, and trust, or sometimes known as psychological safety. Now I put together my hands-on experience of leadership and my academic knowledge and my continued research. I do a lot of writing talks and I work with leaders to create the right conditions for the human being to thrive because we're, um, we need to understand actually how to do it. Okay, so let's just go straight in and get the knife in under the fourth rib. Experience has taught me that there's an awful lot of received wisdom, which is anything but wise. A lot of management beliefs drive the wrong behavior. A lot of HR policies are all about controlling people versus creating the conditions needed for human beings to thrive. Let, let's start with the wise, first of all. What's the history of that and why has it persisted despite the fact we see so many people who live for the weekend rather than go to work and thrive when they're in their workplace? I know, isn't it a shame that the, uh, the working week is the, is the miserable commute to the weekend? Yeah, it, it, it's actually, I think it's, it's a fascinating history, actually. You know, when we, when we look back, you know, about 300 years, we took men from the, the farms and into the factories. We set up educational systems to be able to give them English and maths so that they could, could work within the environments. And then we placed them on factory lines and started then to look as to how we could control this factory line. The fact that they were, were humans was were, were sort of an immaterial, really. They started to become an expendable commodity. In fact, um, I love the quote or supposed quote from Henry Ford that every time I ask for a pair of hands, I get a brain attached. So what really started around then and one of the most famous is, is Frederick Taylor or Taylorism. So he looked at the science of management. But what he was really doing was looking at how you could create greater efficiency in, in factory lines. Now, that, that's great. I'm not saying there shouldn't be an absence of structure, and he actually did create a great deal of efficiency, but actually it created a very toxic environment for the human being. So what, we've, what we're left with is an environment where we still have a legacy of what was the proverbial carrot and stick, it actually coincided with economic theory, actually almost turning itself upside down just after the, the First World War. I started to look at the human being being this self-serving, individualistic, selfish creature that needed control and management regulation. And that was really what was imposed. And of course, what popped out of that? Our first performance management systems, our appraisal systems, uh, our scoring systems you know, all the way through to then the history of where Myers-Briggs comes in, all of these sort of things that try to control the human being. We've moved away from 
the sort of the manufacturing process or the, or the factory line process that the human beings required on into, and as Drucker first coined the phrase, knowledge worker into the knowledge economy. And of course, now what we're doing now is we're thinking for work. And our ability to be able to use our inherent skills, our ability to create and collaborate and innovate, all the things that actually make us human are stifled by the control that is imposed upon us. And the things that make work fun. Um, yeah. I, 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 I cannot remember a day in the last 20, 25 years where I've been anything less than excited to go to work. And I genuinely feel blessed by that. But it's because I've had the bandwidth to be able to be creative. And I've not found myself in those rigorous corporate structures where you do have that hierarchy and essentially, you know, if I'd messed up, I generally would get fired from a client contract. Um, but that freedom has been something that's worth way more than money to me because Monday morning cannot come around fast enough and Friday evening happens way too quickly. Now, it does make me for a slightly sad, obsessive human being. I'm, I'll grant you that. But this is one of the things that I struggle with. There's the maxim, what you measure happens, what you don't doesn't. And I know that you're not saying do away with measurement. But why is it we measure all the wrong things? We measure lag indicators. In my world, it's uh, the number of dials, the number of leads, the number of appointments, the number of first meetings, the revenue, the profit, a number of proposals, number of demos, none of which really are controllable because it's the behavior that goes in to make those things happen that matter. And most managers are managing using data that is well out of date. It might be you know, three months out of date, because you know, when the quarterly, uh, you know, quarter end results come in, you've already had the problem. And if you look three months before, you'd see where the inputs were wrong, um, and you could have done something about it. So what is it that uh, continues? Uh, my, my pal Mark Schaefer says, the evidence is out there, but the results are not. And uh, in management, the same maxim applies. Well, why is it that despite 300 years of seeing people beaten down and largely disappointing performance across the organization and occasional flashes of brilliance, we still persist with this kind of crap? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? You know, we are so strangled by short term or short sight term that we actually yeah. completely lose focus on the longer term. Equally, a lot of leaders in particularly in larger corporates move pretty quickly. They have a tenure of, you know, 18 months to two years. So they, they have a short term, got to make an impact. So they're not necessarily rewarded for longer term. They're not necessarily rewarded for what I put in place today actually will affect the next generation. I, I, I love, I mean, a lot of what we actually know about what really motivates the human being takes us far back beyond the 300, and it is only 300 years. I mean, it's not even a blink of an eye in terms of evolution but when we look at how we we lived before you know most leaders in tribal situations and particularly I'm thinking about the, the Maori viewpoint is that decisions made today need to be fit for seven generations in advance can you imagine saying that to a corporate leader now I mean yeah. <laughs> just they'd look at you like you were completely nuts you know this short-term strangulation and the measurement of the past. Our, our, the thing is, we've created these really rational work spaces and places. You know, we, we get a great deal of comfort from obsessively measuring the human being. And yet, as you, exactly as you're right, you're, you're measuring the past, you're measuring something that, that's already gone. And that gives you insight. Of course it does to a certain extent, but it's not something to beat somebody else up on. Data is only as good as the insight it gives you to be able to progress and take the next steps forward and to adapt and to learn. You know, forecasting, budgeting, KPIs, targets. I mean, they literally create a stranglehold. But the reason we do it 
is not only a, we've always done it this way, you know, for 300 years, again, going back to that legacy of the science of management, we get a great deal of comfort from certainty. We do actually, as a human being, crave certainty. We do crave influence and control. That's not necessarily about extending it to controlling, but we, we do like to know that we've got some influence in our, in our own lives. So measuring all these things actually gives us a comfort that we're doing our job. I remember working with a extremely successful foreign deal trader, foreign exchange trader, and he was fascinating. And he would actually, he was given targets and he was given a target plus, I think, I don't know, 10% or something. And at that target plus 10%, he'd get, you know, huge commissions coming his way. But he explained the fact that he tended to stop working about three weeks into the month or whatever the quarter was or wherever it was. He'd stop short. And I was fascinated by this, fascinated by the fact that actually he's got these really stretched targets. But he said, I've reached them. I've got no motivation to go any further. I've done my target plus 10%. So whilst he didn't sit back on his laurels, it wasn't really about that. But actually what he was doing, the unintended consequence of the target plus 10%, the incentive, actually didn't see the fact that he could have gone so much further if he was given the right conditions and the right sort of targeting and measuring. Well, we, we, we see this in sales a lot where sales organizations also cap salespeople's earnings. And so what they do is they sandbag. And so this is exactly what your trader was doing. He thought, well, why am I going to bother to do any more? I'll just do the minimum necessary to hit my quota. Then I'll stop. And then I don't have to work so hard the following month. Now, this drives away discretionary effort. And I want to touch on that in a minute. But there's a fabulous book. It's quite a heavy read, but it's well worth it. It's called Snakes in Suits by uh, Bob Hare and Robert Bibiak. And it's all about corporate psychopathy. And on death row in the States, about 3% of the uh, prisoners on death row are clinically psychopathic. In the US boardroom, 5%. Now, that short-termism and the fact that people move very quickly, 18 months to two years, allows them to treat human beings as a utility and commoditize them and use them and abuse them so, and then leave. And in Stephen Covey's book, he talks about the manager uh, who doesn't do the maintenance and then some poor bugger comes after him and then uh, you know, everything falls apart and he gets the blame. Well, again, we see this an awful lot because that emphasis on short-termism, and I think a lot of it is driven by how publicly listed companies, venture-backed and uh, private equity-backed companies are uh, measured by their investors, that drives the wrong kind of behavior. And I see this all the time because what it does is it takes perfectly good viable businesses and turns them into essentially factories that just churn out and burn through people. You know, the battlefield is littered with the corpses of salespeople who are burnt out and angry and disappointed and begrudging. And uh, I, I recently interviewed uh, Karen Mangia and Matthew Sweezy on their latest research. And they came up with um, a blindingly obvious formula. The most common feedback I've had is, oh, it can't be that obvious, can it? And customer success equals customer outcomes over, i.e. more important than customer experience, plus employee experience. And the research on this is really clear. Companies that have highly engaged their employees have a 430% higher profit per employee, 290% higher revenue per employee, 40% lower turnover, 20% higher productivity, and share price growth of over 316% higher year-on-year -year compound. Now, what I'm struggling to understand because I think one of the criticisms that people are likely to level at you is, by God, Suzanne, we're not uh, running a holiday camp. It's not about running a holiday camp. It's about running, uh, creating an environment that allows people to thrive and to get the best out of people. But this obsession with management uh, of, and metrics and control stifles all of that. So 
if you were speaking to a cold-blooded, shark-eyed capitalist, which I'm sure you've worked with a fair number given your background, what do you say to them when they uh, level that accusation at you? Oh, it's fascinating. I get that leveled at me a, a, a great deal. You know, actually, some of the, the aspects that I can I can level are everything from behavioural economics through to <laughs> neurobiology, through to a level of morality as well and ethics. The core thing here is we've got to a point where the system's broken. Just as you were saying there, I mean, the, the research can't be strong enough on where organisations have engaged employees. The thing is, engagement is only an outcome of the conditions that are created for the human being to be sparked in intrinsic motivation. And intrinsic motivation leads to discretionary effort. It's the want to do more. It's the, you know, it's not the Sunday night blues, it's the Monday morning excitement. How many people can actually say that? Is the, is the life you're living worth, worth the cost you're paying for it? And you, you, you only have to look at, you know, in the last decade, productivity hasn't grown. Our engagement levels now are lower than they have ever been. I mean, the last um, report from Gallup, I keep a really close eye there. Their research is fantastic. You know, just the UK is at 85% disengaged. Now, I question that figure. Well, but that it makes a lot more low. sense. That number's too low. It's just, what really interested me in that figure, though, is that 67% of the 85%, they aren't your worst performers. These are the individuals who are coming in every day and they're going through the motions. But what they're doing, and often unconsciously, they're withholding effort. You know, it's this, how, how are you? We don't say fine anymore, which is benign in itself. We now say, oh, busy, like it's a badge of honour. We are burning out slowly. I mean, Jeffrey Pfeffer's work from Stanford University has now shown that workplace stress is the fifth leading cause of death. My God, if we're not doing, if we cannot wake up and understand that everything from the economics to the engagement to the human cost here and we need to do something different what fascinates me is and, and this has been predicted by so many economists you know even back to adam smith and whether you believe in the teachings of Karl marx or not ultimately he was a philosopher and an economic philosopher all of these people were showing that actually the human being strives for a society that's fair that is inclusive, that we can give our contribution, that there's a sense of joint purpose and, and task sharing. All of these things support our intrinsic motivation. We're social primates. Oh, absolutely. We're social through and through. So, with, But what we've tried to do is we've tried to fit human beings into the workplace. What we've not done is actually think about what workspace place is actually fit for humans. And we were speaking earlier on, weren't we? But, you know, the whole sort of human resourcing, can we, can we stop doing that? Can we start resourcing humans? We say humans or the, the people are your greatest assets, you know, to... One they're not, they're ninth after paper clips. Well, absolutely, absolutely. So if you really, to put your money where your mouth is, turn it around. I started my research, actually, through huge frustration, and it was a culmination of several things. I was running a, a huge restructuring program and I had a meeting with a very lovely young lady from a very large consultancy company that was coming in, helping us run our project management office. And I was looking around and you were saying about the, the, the office strewn in, in bodies. Everybody was at a point of, of collapse and, and, and burnout. It was really, really tough. And it was also, it was a change that many people didn't really believe in either. And I remember having a meeting and it was, a, you know, one of these classic meetings, lots and lots and lots of PowerPoint slides. And I remember stopping the meeting when I saw swim lanes and I said, look, hang on a second. None of this, none of this is telling me how I can bring all of these human beings that I am absolutely relying on their skills and their talent, and their ideas and their knowledge to actually get this working. I can force feed anybody to press a different button on a computer but I will end up with a, a broken human being behind it and it culminated with with that meeting and on that day I got my scores on the doors for the latest engagement survey 
And I suppose you could say I passed, you know, I'd, I'd done quite well. You know, my team was theoretically engaged, but I knew enough about stats and I knew enough about the psychology. I was halfway through my second master's at this point, And I was looking at this and thinking, do you know what? I don't actually understand if I'm doing well, why am I doing well as a leader? And this, this was filled, do I know that this was filled up by Joe on a rainy Friday or Sarah on a wet Monday afternoon? I mean, I, I didn't know what, what was going on in their lives. It was meaningless. So I realised at that point that actually I, re, I knew more about the conditions my computer needed to keep it working <laughs> and the human being that I was there to serve and they were looking at me to lead. Wow. How did that make you feel? I mean, I, you know, it, there's, there's lots of things around, you know, sort of false memory and all the rest of it. But it, for me, it was, it was a huge epiphany. I think probably I wasn't far off feeling pretty burnt out myself, actually. It was, it was a sad indictment for me that the World Health Organization updated its definition of burnout. So many individuals that work in the corporate environment look, you know, it's that at hedonia, you know, things don't, don't, aren't fun anymore. And I feel fatigued all the time. And I've, I've sort of lost this energy. Who can't say that from, I mean, okay, from time to time, but continually in the workplace. And for me, this memory was a real epiphany. It was the epiphany that actually got me to to shift my entire focus. I needed to understand what I could do as a leader to create the conditions where those that were looking to me to lead needed to thrive. I mean, not just, you know, I needed to understand the human wiring. I needed to understand it from a, from a neurobiological level. And that's really where, um, where the, the whole thing started for me in terms of that research. I've recently interviewed a fascinating uh, chap, Michael Brody Waite, and uh, he was a recovering or is a recovering drug addict from 2002. He's built three companies up, including an Inc. 500, which he then sold on. And he had, uh, he's been applying the 12 steps in his leadership. And uh, he had a moment when they were a five person company. And uh, they managed to get onto a very large and uh, popular business uh, program on TV. And the net result of that was they were just about to go through massive explosive growth. And he reached the epiphany that he needed to just tell his people, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. I'm the CEO of this small business, which is about to become massive. And I don't know how to be a CEO. Help me out. And this re- reminds me of a conversation that we've had uh, with our mutual friend, Anthony Willoughby. When uh, he was with the Maasai, he asked, so who, who's your leader? And the response came back, well, it depends what the problem is. Uh, we have many leaders. And I think part of getting discretionary effort, part of getting teams of people to be supremely creative is to give them the, uh, that baton of power, that authority, because in their area of expertise, they lead. And yes, you have somebody who, who is a figurehead whose job it is to make sure that the, everybody has a voice. People know what they are meant to be doing so that they can do their best work every day. And Gallup's research, the 12 questions, if any of you haven't read their research on this, just type in Gallup 12 questions PDF. And these 12 questions come up. And each of these get broken down into three, uh, four sections, three sections. And each section, sorry, four sections of three. And each one uh, shows how high up um, the mountain you're effectively climbing in terms of uh, different base camps. And the one question that HR the people who focus on the resource rather than the human, inevitably take out is question 10, which is, do you have a best friend at work? And there's a reason why this question is important. Do, do you want to take this or should I? No, go ahead. I mean, it's, um, I think it's leading beautifully into 
to factors we need for intrinsic motivation? The reason they ask that question is you don't let a best friend screw up. You don't let them get hurt. You confront them when they're doing something stupid and you support them. And part of the problem here, I think, is that because of the way organizations have historically been set up over the last 300 years, we're, we're set up to compete with each other rather than compete with our competition. We uh, have created the environment that encourages excuse-making and blaming and a focus on in extrinsic motivation rather than intrinsic motivation. And one, one of the biggest mistakes I see, and I see this in recruitment all the time, and I see sales managers all over the globe being recruited for their ability, uh, notionally, to be able to motivate a team. Motivation is an internal force. You cannot motivate or convince anyone to do anything ever. Take it out of every job description that you ever put out and every advert, because all you can do, what you can do is demotivate people. And more often than not, your attempts to motivate people will do exactly the opposite, because it will try to impose control. Or you will use incentives that you think will motivate, because they're the things that motivate you. They don't necessarily motivate your team. The number of times I've been involved in sales organizations where they had sales competitions. And to be honest, I'm not really that competitive. What I really want is I love to learn. And what I really love is to be the best that I can possibly be. But the money is a simply a byproduct. So offering me an extra hundred pounds here or there is not going to change my behavior one jot, unless I'm broke. Then it might do. So there comes a certain level where money is a, a driver. It's, a, it's an incentive. But when all of your material needs are met, adding more cash to your pile isn't really very powerful as a motivator for most people. All it is, is an opportunity for you to recognize how much other people value what you do. So what I'm really interested in is how as human beings, our biology and our neurobiology in particular drives trust and drives motivation. So you're clearly an expert in this field. So would you mind sharing some of your ideas around this? Definitely, definitely. I absolutely love everything you're saying. I, don't, I mean, Anthony's story around, you know, we have so many leaders here, what's the problem? It's just such a fantastic piece and I've held on to that for, for a long time it's fascinating to me isn't it because actually when you really think about it leaders aren't actually there to know everything they're not there to, I, and I don't know everything I used to used to have a team full of technically brilliant accountants who knew so much more than I did my job was to create the environment as we're saying that that they could perform that they could do their best that would lead them to discretionary effort and have a, have a great time at work I mean, we were there too long to not try and make this this fun so yeah and you're absolutely right around the uh, the, 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 the incentives this extrinsic incentive it's sort of this constant push of whether it be money or the I don't know the the, the pizza or all the rest of it. Now, I'm not, I'm not here being a bar humbug and saying you shouldn't have some time out together and all of these things. It's great. But understand, actually, that this is not what truly leads to motivation. And it doesn't actually even lead to connection or a true inclusivity either. Just going out down to the pub with, you, with your mates, you know, as and when we, we're, we're able to, it doesn't, it doesn't actually lead to that. So what we've done is we've created this fear-based system and your brain is constantly scanning the environments, so whether you're safe or not. It's just, that is its primary role. It's your survival to keep you on this planet, playing in the gene game for, for longer and past your time physically here. What we've done is we've actually pushed all of these incentives, the benefits, so much around our performance analysis is on what we've done wrong. It's around the around sort of loss aversion in terms of, you know, if you don't do this, actually you will lose out on. It's always looking for the wrongdoers. So 
what we really need to do and what we know is that actually what we want to create is brain safe environments, sometimes called psychological safety. I prefer the term trust. I think when we talk about the term trust and we think about who we trust and how that feels, we can relate to it. You know, just you said about that best friend question, you don't let a best friend fail and they've got your back. That's a trust. You know that actually teams with high levels of trust actually argue more. But because they trust, they can hold the tension. And that's where the creative conflict comes from. Because we, I trust that, you know, you've got my back, I've got your back. But ultimately, what we want to do is create this brain safe, this trust environment. And we talk so much about trust in, the, in organizations. But there's, it's just talked about. What we really need to do is in, equip our leaders with the human leadership skills of knowing actually how to do it. And we know, and it's not difficult. It might be neuroscience, but it's not rocket science. And some of this stuff is so small, little tweaks. And there are seven factors at a fundamental human level that by the the cross cultures and religions and workplaces, everybody who has a brain will be looking, or your brain will be looking for these seven factors to be satisfied and nurtured. If they're satisfied and nurtured, it switches on the reward system. That's your brain saying, you're safe, continue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna flood your body full of you know, these wonderful chemicals like oxytocin and serotonin, and that's discretionary effort. That's that, I wanna keep going. I wanna do a bit more. I wanna come into work. I wanna give this idea because I, I don't fear any recrimination. What are the seven? The seven, yeah. So drivers is the acronym in order to be able to to remember. If you want to know more, contact me in terms of of the writing behind it. But ultimately, in short, in summary, D is for a sense of direction, a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. In uh, behavioural economics, and this is Dan Airely's work, fascinating behavioural economist, worked alongside many of the the, the greats, he talks about it as being the Ikea effect. Now, of course, there are other businesses out there providing the same. (laughs) We're not the BBC. You can just mention Ikea. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's it's that sort of sense of purpose and an end result. You know, I'm, I'm working towards something. Whereas the opposite for and sometimes also called the Sisyphus effect, and Sisyphus was was banished by the uh, the gods of Hades and and had to push a boulder uphill and only for it to roll back down again for all eternity. You know that's futility. That's doing your job, coming in, doing whatever it is you're supposed to do, but not really understanding what difference it makes. Where's the impact? I press these button on my computer. Where does it go? What does it do? Why am I doing this? And that I whole There's a wonderful thought experiment. So, Suzanne, tell me this. Given the choice of a job where you were paid 30 grand a year to do what you loved, and every day you woke up excited to go to work, and the work was meaningful, you had purpose, and uh, you got recognized, and you're working with great people. Option two, you get paid £250,000 a year to produce PowerPoints, print them up, and then I take them, and it's in front of you, without even looking at them, I just shred them. Which one would you want? Well, it's it's immediately, um, it's the, the, the former. And we know that, you know, as long as that 30,000 can put food on my table, and, you know, there is that money level, we understand that, below it is incremental misery, but there's no incremental happiness above it. Yeah. 250,000 will be dis- soul destroying over a period of time. Yep. So that sense of purpose is really important. That sense of direction that, that what I'm doing is worthwhile. The second R is relative position. Now you, you, you spoke about this in terms of that, you know, enabling others to, to lead where they can lead. And as a leader, creating that environment where other people can actually be recognized for their contribution. To know that what I come into is valued by others that it's important, it's worthwhile in terms of, you know, uh, my specialism, whatever it is I do, that actually I am part of 
a, a, a I'm a puzzle piece in a bigger puzzle. And without me, actually, you know, there, there's a hole. But I also understand how I interlink with others as well. There is status within here in terms of relative position, but actually really status. We are hierarchical creatures. There is nothing wrong with hierarchy unless there is an abuse of power. In fact, Philip Zimbardo, who ran the, uh, the famous Stanford prison experiment, labels evil in terms of his definition as the abuse of power. It's fascinating. And actually that, you know, when we think about moving from the, the hero leader, the psychopathy, the short termism to the human leader is a very, very different support mechanism that that recognition recognition that I come into work and I'm valued next one down is inclusion look just as you said we're social creatures first and foremost we are we are really useless on our own loneliness actually which is an unfortunate another epidemic we're facing in the, the western world is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day that's huge so we need each other. We need to be able to connect. The reason we are on the planet where we are right now is our ability to collaborate and to create those ideas together. Inclusion, true inclusion is, you know, we talk so much about diversity and inclusion. You will never get diversity if you don't get real inclusion. Exclusion itself actually triggers the same area, same pain receptors in the brain as physical pain. It's huge. It's called social pain. This is Matthew Lieberman's work. Well, in the past, the worst kind of punishment was exile. It was being thrown out of the tribe. In essence, what it banished you to was a slow and lingering, painful, uh, terrifying death. A quick execution was infinitely preferable. So, okay. I mean, that's really interesting. So what's the V? So V is, uh, is voice. Now, this is going back to, and you were saying about this right at the very beginning, that sense of, you know, the, the price tag over and above the, the salary is, is a sense of freedom and autonomy. It's a sense of choice. It's a sense of having influence in my day. You know, if you think about this on, on the flip side, if I have no control, if I am controlled, if I'm micromanaged, if I'm strangled by, by targets and KPIs, then I have no real say in how I go about doing my work. And it stifles innovation and it switches on the, the, the fear system. So that sense of say, how I say, how I go about things, you know, my autonomy, my ability to integrate all the priorities in our lives. We talk about work-life balance, which actually I have a bit of an issue with because it assumes work and life are two totally separate stuff and I'm one in one thing and one in another. You know, where I go, I am. But it's our, my ability to be able to integrate as an adult all the things that are important, including meaningful work. And then that leads us on to, to equity, which is around a sense of equitable distribution of opportunities. It's about fairness. Actually, we respond so badly or negatively, should we say, towards unfairness. We hate cheats. We don't even have to experience something being unfair to us personally. If we just witness it in the system, it can feel, you know, can trigger the threat circuitry because others have been treated unfairly. It's, it's, a, it's huge. And one of the ugliest yeah. and most divisive human characteristics is a sense of entitlement. I just cannot abide it. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's just me, but when I see someone who behaves in an entitled manner, and I'm not going to point the finger at any specific politicians because there are way too many of them, and celebrities, it's disgusting at a, a visceral level. And it's, I, I think that's one of the ugliest uh, qualities uh, of uh, any human being, a sense that they deserve it just because a sperm met an egg or uh, because they have a, a job title. You don't have the right to treat anybody poorly. No, you, you absolutely don't. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And I'm always fascinated when I see it to understand the social conditioning that's led to that individual really believing it or the entitlement is hiding vulnerability and the ego has come out as a defence mechanism, yeah. which actually points to the fact that they're feeling pretty vulnerable and out of control. But and yeah, they're very brittle. Pardon? They're very brittle. 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, so equity, fairness, and then that leads us to the to the second R, which is which is reliability. You know, we, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but that so we crave a sense of certainty, predictability, security in our life, our work, which is obviously a juxtaposition because actually what's certain in this world is is uncertainty and ambiguity and, and change. And, and there's so many lessons in here actually about how to lead brain safe change. But because your, your brain in itself, in essence, is a, is a pattern matching system, it, it stores all of your experiences in, it, in its filing, you know, your memories. It takes in data through, through a sen- your senses and it, it pattern matches it to past experience. And if something is uncertain or ambiguous or there's a change, you know, there's no file there. So it switches on the threat circuitry because we work on a better safe and sorry premise. So reliability, a sense of security, a sense of I can predict what's happening next and how to to act. A lot of decision making is actually driven by memory. It's not what's presented in front of you. It's uh, harking back to your prior experience and then basing that decision on excluding stuff. Because most buying decisions actually... Bob Mester has done some fascinating work on this, and he worked with W. Edwards Deming, he's an engineer. But um, he says that people often will make space for an idea of how to solve a problem. And many people, I've, I've, since uh, speaking to him, I've uh, asked many people this. And often when they're making an important purchase decision, they started making space for it months or even years, even decades before. And then they start to look passively. And as the problem builds and comes a, you know, a, a crunch point, they start to look actively. And then what they do is they discard and disqualify options. And then they're left with what's left. Uh, and then they make the decision and they buy it. And then they, fir- they have first use. And if it delivers the uh, expected intended outcome, then they continue to use it. If they don't, they ditch it. And if they do, then they uh, continue, They start to develop a habit of usage. But again, what we are looking for is that predictability. Uh, but it, interestingly, it's really interesting that often decision-making is based on huge span of time and experience before you actually come to make the purchase decision. And so this opens up some really interesting conversations around marketing and selling and relationship building and why you should, uh, if you're selling to corporates, you probably need to start your marketing two to three years before you intend to sell to them. Mm -hmm. It's what you're doing is you're just coming in at the point where they're deciding uh, to knock out an RFP. Mm -hmm. Um, Then chances are, at that point, they've probably already done most of their filtering. And uh, you only have a 2.6% chance of winning an RFP based on the number of buying cycles that start. 60% of buying cycles end up in the status quo. 10.4% end up in an RFP, and you have a one in four chance of winning that on average, uh, which is 2.6%. So uh, again, huge message here to leaders uh, in sales and marketing that you need to play the long game. Don't think about how we can get business in for this quarter. What we need to be doing is prospecting for customers for life. And we need to start that whole process years before. Yeah, no, absolutely. We are not rational creatures first. No. We are in anything but. Creatures. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything you do, every decision you make, has already been made somewhere in your emotional brain. Your emotional brain just tells your rational brain what to do. And then we think, oh, aren't we clever? We've, we've done it. We did it rationally. So you're absolutely right. And actually that, that whole process of creating a sense of certainty around you as a seller as well, because you keep cropping up or you're doing all these things, you know, just by seeing that's why branding is so important. It's why all these, because actually you create a sense of comfort because you know it. You know, I have a comfort around certain brands, not necessarily based on any fact or evidence, but because I know them. And because I know it, my brain goes, great, I've got a file on that, therefore I trust it. Well, uh, the research that uh, Gap in the Matrix have done on this is very, very clear. 
Um, and what it says is that people have a relationship with a brand like they do with a best friend. And uh, part of the problem here, and you touched on it, uh, in fact, Mark Twain, who I think is one of the best observers of the human conditions, said that when we remember we're all mad, the mysteries disappear and life stands explained. And we are completely irrational beings. We're creatures of emotion. We're creatures of story. And unless, and th this is one of the things I really did want to touch on, but I don't want to get out of the, the finishing the seven. But one of the things I do want to discuss before we wrap up is how important story is to driving the neurobiology. So just tell me what S is and we'll finish. Right, on. S actually does link very closely to story, but it's, it's stretch. This is in here is everything from winning and accomplishment, learning growth, adaptation. It's a slight juxtaposition, if you like, to reliability, because actually we do want to progress. We do want to strive for, for growth. And the winning, you know, the, the wonderful hedonic rush that we get from, from winning and achieving something. And of course, a lot of the sales environment is, is based around actually that continual sort of drive to, to reach that hedonic state. But actually, more importantly in here, actually, is progress and effort. We are more neurologically rewarded for the effort we put into something than the outcome. So the salesman that knocks on nine doors and gets one sale still needs to put the, the effort in across the whole of the, the nine doors. You know, it, it's if we as a creature had sat down on the savannah and said, actually, do you know what? That mammoth is three days, it's three days down there. And those berries, well, they're a, they're a day's trek to go and find. I can't be bothered. We wouldn't be here. There had to be something in our biology that actually allowed us to keep going. And recognizing people's effort, recognizing that we need a sense of progress every day. You know, this constant busyness that we spoke about, this circling around endless meetings and emails constantly, you know, and actually getting to the end of the day utterly exhausted and having progressed nothing is nothing but demotivating. I have a view that a day without three good lessons and maybe one decent beating is a day wasted. A failure is part of that stretch as well. And if you look at Csikszentmihalyi's work, when he describes how to get into the state of flow, it's always make sure that the goal is beyond their grasp, but not out of their reach. And uh, he talks about cre um, establishing goals that are about 7% beyond where someone's grasp is at the moment, where they think that they can get to. And I've always found that little goals are very helpful. But what I also like is big, hairy, assed, audacious goals. I, I have four at the moment that are driving me, and they are so exciting. It's almost impossible for me to sleep sometimes because my head is racing so much and I've learned so much in the day. This podcast, you know, I've, I've just spent the last two years interviewing some of the most interesting people on the planet. And there's not a day goes by where I'm not thinking about how I can connect stuff. And uh, at the moment, I'm working on uh, projects within business to business and business to consumer. And I'm joining uh, different companies up in order to help them not only go to market more effectively, but if you think about it, a team, the difference between a group and a team, a group is one plus one plus one plus one is five. Whereas a team is one times two times three times four times five. And that's the kind of thing that wakes me up. It's just, just energizing to the point where I'm completely obsessed and must be hell to live with. So I, I know there was a reason why I was going down that road, but I've forgotten it. So, Suzanne, we're coming to the top of the hour, but let's just finish on story and how story drives neurobiology. We're hardwired to hear stories. You think about any culture from the, those that still exist in, in, in a, a tribal format at the moment through to nursery rhymes and, you know, even, even the archers, which was set up to, to deliver you know, really important messages. We, we hear stories and stories evoke emotional response. And when we evoke an emotional response, our memory banks, that filing system 
that feel good connection to whatever that story may be at the time starts to shift our view of the world. And that's how we shift culture, behavior, habits, because we start to hear, we, we, as I said, we were social creatures. We copy others a, a great deal in order to be able to just work out, even if we've never discussed it before, we look around us as to what is socially acceptable, what's the social norms, how do I fit in here? So those stories about a culture, a group, a community, a team, a business, massively important. They can show the purpose of an organisation, they can show the impact of the organisation, they can show your contribution. Um, they're a gift, an absolute gift, but they are um, they're absolutely hardwired. We are hardwired to hear stories. I interviewed Mike Adams, who wrote a book called Seven Stories That Every Salesperson Needs to Tell, and he trains people in storytelling. But one of the things that he said, which was really, really insightful, is that if you want someone to tell their story, tell your story first. So, Suzanne, I originally got into sales, and then I tell my story about that. How about you? How did you get into it? And th that way, they will reciprocate. If you're going to tell your company story, your company story should tell a history in 60 to 90 seconds that allows them to infer a whole heap about the type of business they are, what kind of uh, relationship they can expect after they bought from you. And the, one of the things that really fascinates me is how um, most people, when they tell their stories in business, uh, give facts. And those facts are dull. They mm -hmm. need to wire them with masses of emotional content, uh, but we don't necessarily talk about the emotion. What we do is we create the story so the other person can feel the emotion. And I'm constantly amazed by the power of a really good story. You know, a story can be so much more powerful as a leader than dictating, telling people what to do. You tell the story and then have people then put that give their input in terms of how they can achieve that outcome. Definitely. And in fact, actually, a classic way to switch off the onto the threat circuitry is to tell somebody to do something rather than actually ask their opinion or, or, or get them to think about it. I love the way this feeds into, you know, abstract values that are put up on posters and on walls and mission statements that are told to everybody. Now, actually... Stories are also about co-creating. The real story of your organisation comes from those that experience it. And only then can you create, you know, what your story really is, because what was the impact? How did it change? What did it do? Where's the purpose? Where's the meaning? And to share that story, you know, from everybody who, who is about, who's experiencing you as an organisation, to try to tell somebody that they are supposed to feel something or that these values are what you should be doing without any real definition or co-creation is a story with no soul whatsoever. The stories are so important and I think that we need to do it so much more. You're so right, we stick with facts and it doesn't tell me anything and I don't remember them either. We remember... We remember a good story. Um, Suzanne, I'm deeply, deeply disappointed that we've reached the top of the hour. So unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up. But uh, tell me this, you've got a golden ticket and you can whiz back in time and you can advise the idiot Suzanne, age 23, with one choice bit of advice that you know she would have probably ignored. What would it be? What would it be? Oh, my goodness me. Probably the age of 23, I would have... Uh... I would have shifted from accountancy and actually gone back to university. I think that's where I probably would have told my 23-year-old self to, to go. But actually, do you know what? I have had a very <laughs> eclectic story to get me to this point, and I don't think I would have got to this point without it, with all the ups and a lot of downs that have brought me this, insight which i am so incredibly thankful for i get it i mean the, that's the most common response i get which is um you know i'm delighted with where i am and who i am today and without all the ups and the many downs i'd uh, never have got here okay and um, tell me this 
what are you reading, watching, listening to that you think that leaders should really pay heed to? So, I mean, there are still some absolute favourites for me. John Medina's book on uh, brain rules. Actually, I've just read it again for the third time. It's just brilliantly written and, and says so much. I will always sort of go back to Malcolm Gladwell, his ability to be able to tell that story around such things are so obvious. You know, that beautiful observation is absolutely fantastic. I think that there is a, a great deal. There's not a huge amount coming out at the moment. I want to see more. Harvard are just starting to do something on sapient leadership, which is really sort of human leadership. It's still early days in the research that I'm I'm starting to look look at. Also, this sort of link between, or movement from hero leadership to to sapient or human leader. Again, certain elements are starting to come out. There, I mean, they're my they're my favourites. I've got some brilliant podcast I'm listening to at the moment the growth equation is is fantastic really interesting oh gosh make work better is brilliant so there are a couple that I'm I'm constantly listening to currently thank you so much what are you struggling with what are you wrestling with at the moment getting the message out there I mean and I don't mean that just being able to, to share the story genuinely getting out the tools that work so that we can we can genuinely change how we are living and working they are not difficult as i said before they're not rocket science do you have some resources that you'd uh, be willing to give to people uh, who contact you definitely i've got a I've got, I've got articles i'm just actually due to to launch my human leadership series which are at the moment, a series of 10 uh, sort of ebooks that will be launched uh, quarter one. So I'm really excited about those. But yeah, tons of articles. Um, I do a lot of, lot of speaking as well. So just, I just want to get those tools out there to, to help leaders. So how can people get hold of you? So they can uh, follow me on the usual channels on social media. So LinkedIn, both Suzanne Jacobs and The Seven and Twitter but also my email is suzanne at the7.org.uk. Be delighted to hear from anybody and the7.org.uk is, is the website. And that's Suzanne with two S's, not an S and a Z. It is, yes. My parents thought it was hilarious that they'd be able to give me something I've spent my entire life spelling, but yes, S. So if people want to uh, subscribe to the Human Leadership Series, you're happy for them to email you? Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Suzanne Jacobs, thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus, for having me. It's been a delight. Absolutely. Likewise. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this useful and insightful, and if you haven't, frankly, you're probably deaf, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you feel the urge, then go to Apple Podcasts, scroll down below this fold, and leave an honest review. One, two, three, four, or five stars, all welcome. And if you want to get in touch with me, then email me, marcus at laughs-last.com, or contact me via LinkedIn. If you think you'd be a good guest, or you know someone who would be, then please connect us on LinkedIn, or connect us via email. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.